uh, our guest speaker. And I'm going to read some things uh, here in a moment about uh, uh, Raymond. But I, I got to tell a little story because I thought it was it was kind of humorous. But uh, I noticed uh, Dennis Anderson was back to visit with us today, and and uh, of course he's a retired counselor from the junior high. And I'd heard a story once about Raymond as as uh, he came to us, and he was I guess at middle school, and it was pretty obvious he was a pretty sharp young man. So he was wanting to advance, and so he was up to the junior high, and he was talking to Mr. Anderson about. Uh, advancing up in grade. Being a wonderful man, Mr. Anderson, and he's a little worried. He's worried about socialization. Oh my goodness, here's this young man. He wants to move up. He's gonna be with older kids. Will that work? So he says to Raymond, Raymond, I'm a little worried about you. Why in the world would you want to, you know, move up? I'm worried about your socialization. Uh, why would you want to move up junior high? And he said, well, Mr. Anderson, he said, you know, nobody at uh, the middle school can talk to me about nanotechnology. And Mr. Anderson was kind of pensive and thought about that. And he said, well, Raymond, I'm here to tell you, no one at junior high can talk to you about nanotechnology either. <laughs> so I, I thought that was a humorous statement, but it, it makes the point that he's a brilliant young man. I'll read the biography now, if I can get my bifocals aligned. Raymond Walter and his family moved to their farm in Clark Ridge, Arkansas, when he was 11 years old. He entered sixth grade in Mountain Home Public Schools, but within a few days advanced to the eighth grade at Mountain Home Junior High. He would advance one more year, graduating summa cum laude from Mountain Home High School in 2009 at age 14. An Arkansas governor's distinguished scholar and a national merit finalist, Raymond was featured in the National Merit Scholarship Corporation's 2012-2013 annual report. Since junior high, he has been heavily involved with the Mountain Home FFA chapter and the Arkansas FFA Association, having received an honorary American degree from the National FFA Organization. He graduated from the University of Arkansas Fayetteville in May 2013 at age 18 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics, Physics and Economics, and has since earned a Master of Science degree in Mathematics. Raymond is a Distinguished Doctoral Fellow at the U of A in Mathematics and Physics pursuing doctoral degrees in both those subjects and holds a highly competitive National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. <clears throat> Excuse me. He has the degener degenerative muscular disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and has been featured in Quest magazine published by the Muscular Dystrophy Association. The story of Raymond and his family has appeared in such venues as the Farm Credit National website, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the University of Arkansas Short Takes Video Series, and TEDx in Fayetteville. So uh, I think we all know how special this opportunity is. We get this opportunity now uh, to learn from one of our students, and uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Let's give a very, very warm welcome to Raymond Walter. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Mountain Home Public Schools for the 2014-2015 academic year. And I thank you for welcoming me back to my alma mater, Mountain Home High School. Further, I wish to thank those responsible for me speaking here today, including those of the administration who had invited me, those who helped behind the scenes, and the many who in ways large or small have guided me along my anomalous academic journey. I recognize many faces here today. Many more I do not. Of course, there have been changes in the last five years. Uh, I was just telling a friend recently how the high school library, where she and I first met, has since been moved and the old library converted to an office space. And when I was there yesterday, I barely recognized anyone. But I think it is less the changes and more so that I entered Mountain Home Public Schools late, essentially in eighth grade, I moved through swiftly, finishing five grades in four years. So it was a stranger in a strange land. But perhaps this makes me more akin to Alexis de Tocqueville as he observed the United States of America in their formative years. And thus I'm an astute observer of what makes Mountain Home Public Schools valuable. And I do truly treasure what I have found at Mountain Home 
where even such a stranger as myself can find a home. As a graduate summa cum laude of the Mountain Home Class of 2009, I gave a speech at commencement. Of the various choices, including speeches to the students, the fact that the administrators, and the parents, I chose to deliver the dedication to the faculty. Revisiting that speech years later, I'm amazed at how much they anticipated my present ideas on humility, education, bureaucracy, and many other topics. In that speech, I offered the following charge to the faculty of Mountain Home Public Schools. Education implies the reciprocal activities of learning and teaching. Generally speaking, the student does the learning and the teacher does the teaching. Often, the student is his own, te own teacher. Nonetheless, I can say from personal experience that independent study will give you a newfound appreciation for teachers distinct from yourself. Teachers assist us in our physical, intellectual, and yes, moral education. They fix the potholes, provide navigation instructions, respond to emergencies, and clean up wrecks along the road to maturity. Especially for those of us who are personally close to our teachers, we have all had teachers help in these sorts of situations. Uh, students can even teach their teachers sometimes. For this, our teachers must be humble, yet proud. Humble to know the student is the focus, and humble to know the teacher is a shepherd through the valley of life. Proud to know the teacher is privileged to serve in that essential and inspiring task of teaching. That image of the road to maturity was brought into relief recently when I realized just how much former teacher of mine, assisted fellow student from my graduating class in her intellectual, moral, and even emotional education. I realized just how much of a positive influence a teacher can have on a student. And indeed, that realization rather humbled me, reminding me that teachers can educate even more than they intend. I'll preserve anonymity, though some of you may know about whom I'm speaking. A few months ago, I attended a funeral visitation for the father of a high school friend of mine, one I worked with closely enough back then, back then to come to respect. Much as I regret to say it now, back then I actually found her rather unfriendly. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, this friend seemed to have since grown kinder and had been good to someone I mentioned before. So I came to her father's visitation. As uh, I'd never been to one of those things before, but as you know, as they say, uh, nobody remembers what you say, only that you came. Yet I remember what one person had to say, uh, a former teacher of mine who has contributed a great deal to my own success, uh, and was also close to this friend of mine. From our old teacher, I learned that my friend's father had been ill for a long time. Indeed, since just before I met that friend, uh, not to mention other unfortunate circumstances. It is deeply humbling to learn how much you once misjudged someone. My friend's hardness was not meanness. It was a consequence of suffering. Reflecting further, my respect for my friend increased a hundredfold how she bore that suffering and how far she had come despite it. And thus my old teacher continued to guide me on that road to maturity, teaching me the lesson, as the poet Miller Williams will put it, have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. Moreover, I came to realize how much our old teacher had guided my friend on that self-same road to maturity, helping to clear a seemingly impassable road to providing a constructive, productive outlet. A teacher is at times his or her student's greatest advocate. A 
A teacher has the potential to lead a student from a dark place to a good, prosperous, and bright future. Let no one minimize the importance of teachers. Teachers should be proud, proud to know the teacher is privileged to serve in that essential and inspiring task of teaching. Before I continue, a note of explanation. When I agreed to give this talk, it was my understanding that my audience would be faculty and staff. It may seem to some that talking about teachers, I've neglected to discuss the staff of Mountain Home Public Schools. But everything I've said so far applies to you as well, as will become clear later on. We have discussed why teachers should be proud for what they do. But what of humility? As some of you know, uh, humility is a favorite topic of mine. Uh, and indeed, I gave a talk at TEDx Fayetteville in April entitled, Humility, Knowledge, and Access. Uh, motivated by my challenges and staying humble despite many accolades, I discussed the difficulties of maintaining intellectual humility and one method of overcoming those difficulties, namely, to recognize we don't know what others know that we don't know, and to try learning from the specialized individual knowledge others have that we lack. Here I introduce the topic of humility to the same story I told at TEDx Fayetteville and elsewhere, but with greater consideration for the characters other than myself. As some of you know, uh, I'm from New Jersey. It's like Ohio, but even more so. <laughs> so, in summer 2004, before beginning fifth grade, I met with the principal, the curriculum director, and the child psychologist from my local middle school, Kenneth Arles in middle school. Understand at this time I was reading at a high school or college level, completing pre-algebra and geometry workbooks, and dreaming up ionic jet engines. They refused to advance me to eighth grade algebra or science, or even uh, seventh grade math and language arts. To my face, they said it was because I would socialize better with children of the same age. To my father's face, they said it was because by skipping grades, I was taking food out of the mouths of the teachers as children that I was violating the right of the teachers to teach me. That is bold-faced hubris for anyone who presumes to educate young people. For better or worse, schools are usually bureaucracies managed according to specific rules. But in a bureaucracy, atmosphere can matter as much as the rules themselves. Is it an atmosphere in which the institution, the bureaucracy, and the rules are an end in themselves? Or an atmosphere in which the higher purpose of the rules takes precedence over the rules, institution, and bureaucracy? At my old, there, I should also say, at a school, we know that the higher purpose of the rules is that essential and inspiring task of teaching. At my old school in New Jersey, the rules and the bureaucracy took precedence, and only by fighting tooth and nail would they advance me in the second semester, after which advancing did little good. In my experience at Mountain Home Public Schools, however, that higher purpose of teaching took precedence. I'd like to tell you about that experience. I was 11 years old when my family moved to our farm in Clark Ridge, Arkansas, less than a week before starting classes at Mountain Home. I was placed in sixth grade at Pinkston, but we immediately discussed with Steve Berkman and others the possibility of me advancing academically. Incidentally, uh, last summer I picked up my cumulative record from the high school, and I got to read all of the paperwork filled up by my parents and others uh, in this process. In any case, uh, I met with the junior high school counselor, Dennis Anderson. Very glad you could make it, Mr. Anderson. Uh, I took a short diagnostic math test, though he tells me that didn't matter much. And, of course, you've heard part of this story, but if 
you'll excuse me, I'd like to tell my way. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Anderson asked me, uh, why do you want to be in the eighth grade, Raymond? And I asked him back, who can I talk to about nanotechnology in sixth grade? You won't find anyone to talk to in eighth grade about that either. <laughs> oh. So besides removing any concerns about better socializing with children of the same age, this convinced Mr. Anderson to advance me to eighth grade uh, in Algebra 1 and all advanced classes in that first week of classes. I was nervous to take pre-AP English with Rita Sherman, though he assured me I could handle it. And indeed, I was one of her top students that year. Uh, I was also very interested when he mentioned the agriculture class. I'd never heard of such a thing. And later, uh, Mr. Jerry Anderson introduced me to Jackie Albright so I could join the FFA. My views on education are strongly influenced by the 1912 book, The Montessori Method, by Maria Montessori. Montessori's original method was conceived as a scientific pedagogy whose basis was scientific observation of the child's behavior and wherein lessons correspond to scientific experiments. And as in scientific observation and experiment, minimal interference with the subject is essential. In pedagogy, this means we must preserve the liberty of the child. Is the liberty of the student wherein we find the spontaneous manifestation of his or her personality, interests, and abilities. And it is the task of the educator to cultivate those spontaneous manifestations into an individual of good conduct and purposeful life, directed by those interests and contributing according to those abilities. This should be together with a broad enough foundation of knowledge to accommodate unprecedented changes in one's life and with an understanding that life does not happen. Rather, we make things happen, and we can plan for the future. It is my belief that Mr. Anderson, though perhaps not consciously, did the essential thing of preserving my liberty as a student by allowing me to be educated according to those abilities and interests I manifested spontaneously, not according to my chronological age. This requires humility, both by so putting the student first and to ensure that this authority to control the student's academic progress is applied judiciously, carefully. This is individual advocacy for academic access or access to appropriate academic, intellectual, and scholarly resources to allow a student to pursue his or her own potential. And insofar as a school allows students to so pursue their potential, it has achieved academic access. Mountain Home Public Schools certainly provided me academic access. When I expressed interest in advancing yet another year, they encouraged me to take correspondence courses from the University of Missouri Online High School. I was free to choose to develop my speaking ability and employ my research skills in extemporaneous public speaking in the FFA, and likewise to use my mathematical skills in a real-world application to the Farm Business Management Career Development event. And many other opportunities were open to me. As educators, we should make other students aware of these opportunities and encourage them to pursue those opportunities. The institution of a school is a place for the education of youth, where its higher purpose, the essential and inspiring task of teaching, should take precedence over the institution itself. I believe Mountain Home Public Schools, though of course not perfect, has allowed that task of teaching, educating, to so take precedence and thereby attains a high degree of academic access. And in a school district as large as ours, a great many people must cooperate to accomplish this feat, and there must be an extensive division of labor among those many people. I don't just mean the division of labor among faculty, instructors of students of differing levels of academic preparation,
teaching different subjects, but also that division of labor among administrators and especially staff. At the very least, members of the administration and staff contribute indirectly to the education of students in Mountain Home Public Schools. Transporting thousands of students safely to and from school each day, feeding thousands of students and employees, coordinating thousands of students, staff, and faculty, and their interaction with the wider community, networking thousands of computers, maintaining many buildings, managing millions of dollars with less need for financial resources, and more of them when needed. Without fulfillment of those tasks, education of students at Mountain Home Public Schools would never occur. Moreover, the administrators and staff can and do also contribute directly to this education. I believe in leadership from ourselves and respect from others. In particular, I believe each of you associated with Mountain Home Public Schools is capable of being leaders, leaders among youth, in particular leaders presenting the most important kind of leadership, that by example. An Arab proverb says, a fig tree looking upon a fig tree becometh fruitful. But what sort of tree should you strive to be? What example should you set? That of compassion for and humility toward everyone you meet, and to let the love of learning be a guide to life not just learning from the wider world around us, but the people we meet too, to enter into mutual fellow feeling with our peers, and to learn from the specialized individual knowledge of everyone we meet. As I've emphasized elsewhere, this means we should pay attention to and learn from the people we would otherwise ignore. See the ghosts, talk to the ghosts, learn from the ghosts. You might be surprised by what you can learn about middle English literature from a tech guy, about farm life in Oklahoma from a bus driver, about caring for stroke victims from the classroom handicap aid, about chemical manufacturing in Colorado or on the west coast from another tech supervisor, about school maintenance during the winter break from a janitor. And that's not even mentioning what our teachers can teach outside the classroom. Reserves replacement ratios used by petroleum companies. What phantasmia is. T.S. Eliot's essay on tradition and the individual talent. And ad infinitum. We can build a community dedicated to mutual respect and mutual learning. Leading through example the young people we educate. Leading them into a good, prosperous, and bright future. And these students can even teach their elders a thing or two, not just those students who can independently prove integral formulae, but the ghosts we may otherwise ignore, from the kind-hearted autistic giant who can draw perfect reproductions from a photographic memory, to a hard-hearted bright girl of strong will and capacity for kindness who only needed a teacher's guidance. I've been closely associated to the Mountain Home FFA chapter for nearly a decade. Those of you familiar with how the chapter is organized know we have something of a junior chapter at the junior high school with its own officer team. In ninth grade, I served as president of that junior officer team, where I became acquainted with the FFA opening and closing ceremonies. I think in closing, it is only appropriate to appropriate the final words of the FFA opening ceremony. I modify it only slightly for our different purposes today. Administrators, faculty, and staff, the educators of Mountain Home Public Schools, why are we here? To practice brotherhood, honor educational opportunities and responsibilities, and develop those qualities of leadership which a teacher of young people should possess. May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare 
the 2014-2015 academic year at Mountain Home Public Schools duly open for the business of teaching or attention to any matters which may properly be presented. Thank you very much.